Welcome to the Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. If you're visiting with us today, please fill out a visitor's registration card in the pew rack in front of you and drop it in the offering plate later in the service. If your child becomes restless during the service, we have a live feed of the service in the family room at the entrance to the children's ministry. All parents of youth age students will be having a meeting in the sanctuary next Sunday during the ABF hour. Please plan to attend if you're a parent of a youth age student. The men's retreat is October the 27th and 28th at Camp Manawagon. We'd like all men to consider joining us. Registration forms may be found at the information table. This Wednesday before youth, we will have a hangout time for our students, which will take place at 6 p.m. We will have games and snacks during this time. This Saturday, we will have a work day for our students at Friends Farm. We are encouraging parents to come out and work along their students. Uh, if your child needs a ride, please have your child meet at the church at 9 a.m. and we will have them back around 1. On October 1st at 3 p.m., we will have a young adults fall cookout, which will take place at Kelly the Lots. If you need the address, please check the bulletin. Thanks for coming today. For more information, visit our website at mgbconline.com. morning. Welcome to MGBC this morning. A nice fall, um, going towards fall, foggy morning this morning. Um, also, those who are watching online, we welcome you as well and anybody who's over in the other room stuff. But please rise and we'll do our call to worship this morning. It's um, Psalms chapter 62, verses 1, then also verses 6 and 8. For God alone, my soul waits. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you this morning that uh, we open up the doors to this building and the church comes in. And Lord, in your word here this morning in Psalms, we're reminded that you are a refuge, Lord. And we just thank you for that. We just, just, uh, just give you all praise for that. And Lord, now this morning as we um, sing the songs of worship, we just uh, lift up our voices in praise to you, Lord. And as we um, listen to the message this morning, pray that your words are coming through the pastor and also just that we'd have open ears and open hearts to apply your truths to our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.
So, Carl, where did you get the money for this car? I got it working down at the car wash. <laughs> car washing. Car washing. I love this car. It's a Mustang, you know. Mustang Sally. Mustang Sally. I don't know, Carl. I don't think it's a Mustang, but you sure do drive it fast. Oh yeah, she is fast. Hey, aren't we supposed to get food or something? Isn't this a progressive dinner? I sure do like driving with you, Carl. You drive crazy. Uh-oh. I've done it again. <laughs> It seemed like a good idea at the time, <laughs> but now in retrospect, remember I was talking to you about people for the choir? I don't think you're going to find any there. So anyways, I don't know what to say. Let's just go on with announcements. I think that's the best thing. Uh, for those of you that would be interested in uh, going with us on a short-term mission trip to Haiti, February of next year, uh, that's February of next year, uh, we're starting an organizational meeting next Sunday. There's information in your bulletin, but if you are interested in going on our short-term missions trip or missions exposure trip, uh, next Sunday is an organizational meeting here at 3 o'clock over in the multi-purpose room. So encourage you to uh, give some prayer and consideration for that. Also for Haiti, you'll notice there's a table in the lobby. Uh, we're selling gobs as a fundraiser to raise funds to help people uh, pay for their trip that are going uh, this November. Remember, we're we're leaving for uh, in the latter part, or first part of November. We're headed down uh, to Haiti, and some of those people could use some financial help in uh, paying for their tickets and and all of that. So if you would like to purchase some gobs, uh, Darcy Burkheimer will be at the table in the back. Also, just a reminder, Brant did a video announcement for all those parents of junior high and senior high youth, junior high and senior high youth parents, next Sunday here in the worship center during the ABF hour. We would like you to come over. We would like to uh, spend some time with you. Pastor Darrell is going to go over uh, his vision, his thoughts, and the church's vision and thoughts with respect to our youth ministry. And so we want uh, the junior high and senior high parents next Sunday following the worship service to just remain here in the uh, in the worship center. And uh, I have some update. There's uh, some information. Uh, Rusty wanted me to get with all of you and let you know that there are some churches in Florida that need some assistance, Grace Brethren Churches as well as others and the community as well. <clears throat> it says our Florida churches could use some help perhaps over the next three weeks uh, with structure and property as well as community outreach. Uh, Sun Tree Grace in Melbourne is looking for community help in their cleanups. Uh, Gospel Life in Palm Bay, uh, their floor was ruined by the flood uh, in their children's area. There's also a Vel Velrico Grace Brethren Church in Miami. The roof needs repair uh, of their children's, their children's section. And Brooksville Grace Brethren Church 
there was water damage in their building. So if uh, you are skilled or unskilled labor and you would like to take part in one of these trips, please contact the church office or uh, Rusty and uh, Kristen Russell, and they can get you some information there to coordinate our efforts together. This morning, we want to pray for Homewood. I think we have a picture. Very good. Uh, many of you have family that uh, are being cared for there or live there, and I know that many of you also do a lot of volunteer activities there at Homewood. So this morning, as the ushers come, we would like to pray for Homewood, for the people there, for uh, Chaplain Jerry McCuller as he leads over there at Homewood. So uh, if you would join me in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessings that you provide to us, and one of those is an opportunity uh, Father, to um, carefully and efficiently care uh, for those as they, um, as they grow older. I thank you for Homewood. I thank you for their ministry in this community, for the care and the medical attention that they provide so many of our loved ones. I also want to pray a blessing upon the leadership there, as well as uh, Jerry McCuller and uh, his staff, and also for many here that are seated here this morning that volunteer in a variety of capacities there. We just thank you and praise you for uh, how you are blessing through them. Give them strength. Give them guidance, Father, in their work. Uh, we ask that you would bless each gift and giver this morning. Uh, we worship you through our tithes and offerings, and we thank you and praise you for all that you have done, are doing, and will do. In thy name we pray. Amen. This morning we're uh, moving into chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. Um, so, Logan, go ahead and pull that verse up. Uh, yeah, this is chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Um, we looked at this a little bit last week, too. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Um, again, Jesus came into the world to give us uh, mercy, to, to save us um, so that he might display his perfect patience as an example for, for unbelievers so that they might, uh, in turn, believe in him for eternal life. Um, so let's take some time to, to think on that thought. Uh, excuse me. Um, if you didn't know, some of us were at the Uprise Festival until about 1.30 last night, so sorry for my voice. Um, let's take some time and uh, reflect on that thought and thank God for that, the fact that he shows us mercy, um, and ask him who he wants us to show that to uh, as well. So let's take some time. And once the plates make it to the back of the balcony, then we'll stand and we'll worship together. Please stand. I belong with you. 
I know I'm not alone I know I was a sinner In need of a new start The waters of my river Ran dry on my own I know the road is long When all is lost You light my way My debt is paid in Jesus'
to the world to save. Despite our sin, you still forgave. Your saving mercy you have shown. That your perfect patience might be known. All honor and glory. All honor and glory forever and ever we say. To the immortal, invisible, eternal King. You alone are God of everything. For those along our path And intercede on their behalf It's good and pleasing in your view For all to understand your truth and glory forever and ever we stay to be immortal and visible eternal Forever and ever we sing To the immortal, invisible, eternal Sing that again, all honor and glory All honor and glory forever and ever we sing To the immortal, invisible, eternal King You alone are God you alone are God of everything. Sing that chorus one more time. All honor and glory forever and ever we say. To the immortal, invisible, eternal. His body was broken, he died in my place. Hope for the hopeless, he conquered the grave. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, Jesus made a way. That day, that day, the sun when he prayed in the garden, etc. 
accepted the will of the Father. He chose the cross that day. That day, the sins of the world unaccounted. The one who the prophets had spoken chose the cross that day. His body was broken. He died in my place. Hope for the hopeless. He conquered the grave. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Jesus made a way. Day. He cried out to the heavens, the earth shook with pain for the Savior, He bore the cross that day. was broken, he died in my place, oh for the hopeless, he conquered the grave, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, Jesus made a way. love has won hallelujah Jesus Christ has overcome hallelujah it is finished love has won hallelujah Jesus Christ has overcome body was broken, he died in my place, hope for the hopeless, he conquered the grave, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. Dear Lord, hallelujah, you made a way. We were destined for hell and punishment because of our sin, but you made a way through the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're coming to this earth because you love sinners and you wanted to save us. You wanted to rescue us. 
give us a brand new start. I pray that we'll be encouraged today from your word, from the truth of your word, that we won't listen to the lies of the world and how the gospel today is being contaminated by many false thoughts. We're so thankful for the truth of the scripture, that it is an anchor in a world that uh, needs hope, needs the truth. Bless our service today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's now time for the children to head to their worship time. Well, last Sunday, Pastor Brian began our new study in the book of 1 Timothy, which and he provided background to the book. And today we want to uh, dig right in to chapter 1. And we'll be working through this book now until Christmas time, which isn't actually that far away. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Our focus this entire year has been the heart of God, God's love for people. God's love for sinners, God providing salvation for us, and the gospel message of Christ. And today, that theme will continue in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1. We see here that Paul writes to his young disciple, Timothy, to encourage him as a pastor. It seems that Timothy had become discouraged by his church. We're not sure what was going on, but something was happening. Every pastor faces discouragement at times in his ministry when we see the church from a human perspective. We need to have God's perspective. And so Paul writes to Timothy to encourage him. Possibly these problems focused on the area of false teaching by individuals in the church. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And so Timothy, I'm sure, is discouraged by this. But Paul writes and encourages him. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4 and following. That is page 576 in the Pew Bible in front of you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. It's pretty obvious from this verse that most likely Paul led Timothy to Christ and that he became a child of the faith. Then the scripture continues as Paul writes, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. These verses aren't unusual. It's a typical greeting that you would have in a letter to a church or to individuals, in this case to an individual, and then it was to be read to the churches. But Paul adds a unique word here from a typical greeting. He puts the word mercy in the greeting, which is not what he normally has in his greeting. He normally says grace and peace, but in this particular book, he says grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I think it is a theme word for this entire chapter, so I want you to keep that in mind, God's mercy, and we'll be explaining a little more about what that is later. Now let's look at verse 3. It says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. No one is really certain from the study of this passage what those false teachings were at Ephesus. We're just not really given insight on those speculations and meaningless genealogies, what, that, what that's really talking about. Some think it's possibly Gnosticism. And I don't know if you're familiar much with the, the cultic belief of Gnosticism that the early church had to face quite a bit. In fact, the book of 1 John is really dealing with that false belief of Gnosticism. So I, I wanted to explain that a little bit to you. We're going to be in a college class here for just a couple minutes talking about a philosophy that is not biblical, but there were two main erroneous views of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is difficult to nail down, actually. By the way, there's a lot of different beliefs with it, 
But here are the two main things that we have problems with concerning Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the physical realm was evil and that the spiritual realm was good. Gnostics concluded that it was all right to sin in the body since the body was evil. Basically, you have an excuse to sin because your body's evil. The spiritual part, or as they call it, the spark in man, was good. The spiritual would cover the evil physical parts. So this type of dualistic view of the person is not a biblical view. Man's physical actions and pursuit of sin impacts his spiritual life completely. When we sin, it impacts the spiritual life. And the scripture says we are dead in our sins and we will be punished for our sins. We can't become better on our own. In addition, Gnosticism believed that they needed to obtain to a higher knowledge that was gained from a mystical place and not the God of the Bible. Possibly these are some of the beliefs that Timothy was dealing with in his church, but we're not totally certain. It's also possible that there were false Jewish traditions from the one term, it seems to indicate that. There also uh, was this view that your ancestors, your genealogy impacted who you were. And because if you had bad genetics in your ancestry, well, that's why you're bad too. You kind of have a pass. It's clear that these teachers did not understand the truth of the gospel and the purpose of the Old Testament law. They had twisted the law around in what I'm going to call today the fake gospel. And the fake gospel pervades our society and even many churches today. And even some good Christians who believe in the true gospel can fall into the pit of the fake gospel gospel. Today we hear a lot about fake news. There has been some fake news concerning the hurricanes recently. Several pictures have gone viral all over the internet as truth concerning Hurricane Harvey in Texas. I want to show you a few of these fake photos. The first photo that you'll see was supposedly the hurricane moving in 90 miles uh, east of Corpus Christi. And this picture was taken and Wow, it looks like that's terrible, and it's heading to shore, and that's the hurricane coming, and people reported it as news, and guess what? That picture first circulated on the internet in 2003. It's probably a complete fake. The next photo, a news person who will remain nameless, was duped when she sent this Twitter photo and mentioned that gators were moving into one of her friend's uh, areas there, neighborhoods in Texas. This is probably a real photo, but not during Hurricane Harvey. It was another time. The next photo was flood victims in Houston supposedly using a refrigerator to escape the floodwaters. This is an actual photo, but it was from last year's flood, not Hurricane Harvey, but it was reported that it was from Harvey. This photo that you're going to see is a real fake. It's reported that the Houston airport flooded during the hurricane, and then this photo circulated on the internet. However, this photo is actually a computer artist's rendition of what would happen if we had 25 feet of seawater rise in LaGuardia, New York. It's not even the Houston airport. Fake news. And finally, this photo went viral after an individual on a news channel showed this picture and reported it as truth that a shark was swimming down the freeway outside Houston. But this photo is completely photoshopped. That means they stuck the shark in probably what was a real photo. It's completely fake. So what are we to believe today? Do you struggle with what you hear we, we have to be discerning about what we believe and what we hear. Everything we hear is filtered by other people. And there's all kinds of fake news that's out there. And I hate to tell you this, but there's fake news in the church too. There's a fake gospel. And Timothy was dealing with that fake gospel. People twisted the gospel around for their own purposes. And it wasn't true. 
And that's what we're going to deal with today. Let's look at verse chapter 5. This verse is an awesome verse. This could be our theme verse for the entire series. It fits perfectly. Verse 5 of 1 Timothy 1. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. We must have the heart of God. And agape love that it's speaking here. It's the main verb in this section. And counteracts the false teachers. God's love, his true love, counteracts the false. And what is true love? This is true love. And we all should have the love of God. And we should all have this kind of love for God and for one another. We need to have a pure heart. What does that mean? It means we ought to be awfully authentic and real and genuine. Not fake. We need to have a good conscience. We need to deal with sin in our lives and put it under the blood of Christ and forgiveness. None of us are perfect. We all have our faults. But we need to have a good conscience by allowing Christ to wipe our sin away and to renew us each day to make us authentic Christians. And then three, we need to have a sincere faith. The word sincere here is meaning without hypocrisy. What does that mean? Well, we hear that. That's a biblical term, hypocrisy. What does that mean? Well, when Jesus referred to the, the religious leaders as being hypocrites, he was actually referring to the theater of the day, the plays that they would perform. And actors would actually play multiple parts in the plays. They would switch characters in the play. All they would do is they would switch mask. You would wear a different mask as a... Di- for, to be a different character. They were called hypocrites. Hypocrites are people who switch, who switch their mask. They're basically fake. They're actors. Christians should not be hypocrites. We cannot be actors. We cannot be pretenders. We must be true. Why do people believe in the fake gospel today? Because they see the fake gospel demonstrated by hypocrites. Ouch, this one hurts. But we all need to be very concerned about what we portray to the world around us. Are we authentic and real? It really irks non-believers, especially young people, when we are not real. Now, being real means that we admit when we're sinners when we're wrong. Not being arrogant. Pretending to be better than everyone else. But many people in the church are hypocrites. And that's not showing true love to the world around us. Let's look at now at verses 6 and 7. Here are these pretenders, these fake teachers that were impacting this church. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. These fake teachers desire to be puffed up and proud and experts in the law. Their goal was to basically build themselves up and to look good and to just argue for argument's sake. Have you ever been around people who just argue for argument's sake? We can argue theologies till we're blue in the face that aren't totally clear in Scripture. There's some answers that we need to simply say We don't know the answer. But sometimes people just want to argue for argument's sake of theology or whatever it might be. Sometimes we don't know the answer. Only God knows. These people weren't concerned about the truth of the gospel. They were only concerned about themselves and building themselves up for their own purpose. Now look at verse 8. It says this, which this is a key verse. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. This verse shows the law points out people's sin. That's the purpose of the law. It's to show you that you're a sinner. It's not a prescription of how you earn your way to God. It simply is a mere It shows you the real person. It doesn't correct sin or make you better. It simply shows you that you need a Savior. 
Paul mentions numerous sins now, actually about 15 here in 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 and 10. He says this, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers. And just to be certain, Paul adds this to make sure he covers all the other sins. And whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, literally hypogenic doctrine, pure, pure doctrine of the Scripture. The law simply says you're a sinner. And none of us are better than anyone else. We're all equal. Christians should not be arrogant above non-believers because we were sinners too. And we still fall back into our old practices of sin. But there's one thing that's different. We've trusted the true gospel of Jesus Christ that covers our sin, makes us righteous, but has nothing to do with what we have done. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. The false gospel in our world today says we don't need the gospel, that man is able to arrive himself. Man has gotten so much better, hasn't he? You can see it all the time in the news. Man has arrived. We're so much better than in the past. But in reality, all sin offends the law. If we offend the law in one way, James 2.10, we are guilty of all. No one is perfect. Everyone is a sinner. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 counteracts this false gospel that is being spread around our world today. For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works or arriving so that one may boast. Let's realize that every religion has the fake gospel. Every religion, every religion, did you get that? Has the fake gospel. Every religion on the face of this earth says man can work his way to God. You can save yourself. You can arrive. You can become a God yourself. You can become good enough. You can punish your body and work yourself into a tizzy, and you will eventually arrive and become good enough. Friends, this is fake news. It's the fake gospel preached by Satan himself. And he has propagated it even in the church and even has beat down believers of the true gospel to believe that you must perform for God in order to have his approval. Pastor Brian addressed this a couple weeks ago when he talked about the performance mentality. It pervades our thinking. We must put it under the blood of Christ and realize that we are saved by grace, not by the way we perform for God. Don't be, don't be led into the trap of Satan. Now, maybe this is a little confusing to us. Or what do you mean by the fake gospel versus the true gospel? I thought maybe it would be helpful to put some thoughts in a chart of what the differences are of the fake gospel and the true gospel. So I have on the screen this chart. Let me just talk about this now a little bit. The fake gospel says you must follow the law for God's approval, like these false teachers were teaching. But the true gospel says you receive God's approval by His grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. The fake gospel is based on Satan's lies. He wants you to believe you have to work your way to God. But the true gospel is based on the truth of the Word of God. The fake gospel says that you need to work and earn your way to God and receive his acceptance. But listen to this. The true gospel is about resting in the finished work of Christ on the cross and realizing that Jesus conquered sin and death by being raised to life. He finished the work. We must simply rest 
in him. We work because we love the Savior. It doesn't mean we don't work. We just become lazy couch potatoes because we're believers in Christ. We work and serve with passion, but not to get his approval or his salvation, but to show our love back to him because he's given us everything. That's the true gospel. The fake gospel says you're a piece of dirt and you deserve hell as a Christian, even as a Christian. But that's a lie of Satan. Only condemned sinners deserve punishment. The true gospel says you have received mercy. There's that word again. Mercy is not getting something you deserve. Sinners deserve punishment. But when you become a believer, you don't deserve punishment anymore. But some of you live as if you deserve punishment. And when you fall back into sin or you struggle with sin, Satan tells you you're no good and you're not a good Christian and you're not even a Christian and you were just a big faker and he defeats you in your life. And then you don't live with power as a Christian because you're not living your faith through the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life. The Bible says this, and some of you have a hard time believing this, even as a Christian. You are holy. You are set apart. You are a saint of God. The New Testament talks about that a lot. When do we hear sermons on the fact that you are a saint of God? We talk mostly about being sinners. But the Bible declares you a righteous saint because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. You're an heir of the kingdom of God. You're a son of God. You're not a worthless sinner. The false gospel tries to get you to live with the heavy burden of guilt. Many of you are are motivated by guilt from past sin. Maybe sins that you've dealt with all of your life. You need to put that under the gospel of Christ. Allow him to help you with those besetting sins that weigh you down. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you've given him your sin, you are free from the burden. That doesn't mean you won't sin. That doesn't mean we become perfection, perfection, or perfect. We won't become perfect till heaven. There's a process of becoming holy. It's called sanctification through the work of the Holy Spirit. But why do we allow the past to weigh us down? I struggle with that all the time, looking to the past. Or how I let God down today. Or how I let him down this week. or We got to let the past go. You can't change the past. You can't do anything to change the past. But you sure can change the future. And you sure can rest in God today to give you power to live through the gospel of Jesus Christ today in your life. And as you live out the gospel as a faithful Christian and you're authentic and you're sincere in your faith, having a heart of love for God, a pure love, It will impact this world in a way that nothing else can. And they will want the gospel of Jesus Christ too. That's the true, true gospel. The false gospel is focused on God's wrath that is intended only for non-believers, for Satan and his followers. You're not destined for the wrath of God. God is not up there seeking to beat you down every time you sin. Will you blow it today? Shame on you. That's not God. That's a lie of Satan. God says, I love you. I will help you overcome that. Rest in the gospel of Christ. Let me help you. That is the true gospel. 1 Timothy, verse 12 of chapter 1, goes on to mention Paul's perspective personally on these things. I find it interesting that he shares his personal perspective. He says this in verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he has judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy, there's that word again, because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. The word thanks, being thankful, is in the emphatic position in the text. It's like Paul is literally saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, 
for saving me, for using me, to allow me to serve. I was the worst sinner. You know, people see that list of sins and say, wow, that's really judgmental, some of those sins. And today we can't judge anybody. We can't offend anybody. Well, guess what? Everyone needs to be offended. Everyone's a sinner. You won't come to the gospel of Christ if you're not offended. The gospel is an offense. And Paul wasn't being arrogant. He was saying, he didn't list those 15 sins earlier to say, oh, these are all the bad people and I'm the righteous religious one. He's saying, I was like that once. I was a Pharisee. I was the best you can get. And guess what? I was deluded by the false gospel of following the law and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and woke him up and brightened up his life and he realized he needed the Savior, he realized I was a blasphemer. I said Jesus was not God. I tried to kill Christians. I threw him in prison. I was uh, arrogant and belligerent about it. And God saved me from all of that stuff. He put all of those actions under the cross of Christ. That's the true gospel. So no matter how bad you are, you can come to the gospel. I've heard of someone recently that's older and near death. They won't come to the gospel because they said to the the pastor that met with them, and they only have maybe weeks to live, I can't trust the gospel because I'm not good enough. No one's good enough for the gospel. That's what the true gospel is all about. You aren't good enough, but Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to be in heaven forever, and he wants you to live a successful, powerful Christian life right now. That's part of the gospel. We're not just saved for eternal life. We're saved for life now. Eternal life is part of life now. And Paul is saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for using me. He didn't just save them, but he was able to write many books of the Bible. Paul is revered in many ways as being such a godly man. And I know he wouldn't want us to do that. He would say, I I was a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. And I can't believe God would use me after all that I did to hurt the early church. 1 Timothy verse... uh, or chapter 1, verse 15, is a critical verse, as we sang earlier in our song. This is a wonderful verse. It is the gospel message in a nutshell. It says this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And this is the main part of the phrase. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the foremost, or the chief. Paul says, I was the biggest sinner you could ever find. But Jesus came to save sinners. The gospel is so simple. And that's why a lot of brain, brainiacs, people that are really smart and philosophers and college professors and a lot of people that write tons of books or whatever, that's why they make fun of Christians that we're too simple and we're too, you know, simple-minded. But the gospel is for Everyone. So that's why it's simple. Christ came to save sinners. That's it. I really don't have anything else to say on that verse because that says everything. That impacts everyone in this earth. Jesus came to save you. All you need to do is submit to God. That's the true gospel. Because God wishes none to perish, 2 Peter verses three, uh, chapter 3, verse 9. Have you trusted the Savior? Do you believe in the good news of the gospel that you can be saved from your sin? Do you need to come to the Savior today? Maybe you have sat in this church for a long time and you've never really truly given your heart and life to Jesus. Maybe you have prayed the prayer and you've trusted Christ but you've never understood truly the gospel means simply resting in the finished work of Christ. Picture this. What if we realized every person on this earth was drowning because of his or her sin? And without help, the sinner is going to perish. What if, however, there was a lifeguard 
who had a life preserver? What if the lifeguard would jump in and take on the sin and save the drowning sinner? That's what happened in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the lifeguard. He's the Savior. He's waiting for you to simply cry out and ask for help. He'll be there at moment's notice, guaranteed. But many reject his willingness to help. They're self-sufficient. I don't need any help. I can swim. I'm good enough. And they kick and they flail and they swing their arms and they choke on the water and they're drowning in sin. And there's no hope. Because if you have sin, you can't swim. Because one sin condemns you to drowning eternally in a place called hell. And the lifeguard standing there, he wants to rescue you and to turn your life around. He wants to pull you out of that sin and give you a new life, a victorious life to move on. Because Luke 19 verse 10 says this, for the son of man, the lifeguard, I'm gonna add, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Unfortunately, as the passage concludes, not everyone in Timothy's church knew this true gospel. Some were drowning because of their belief in the false gospel. Maybe some of these teachers, and even two names are listed here. It says that they were shipwrecked in their faith due to their false belief, and they were even given over to Satan. They pretended to be Christians. I believe they were fake. They deluded even themselves. And they were drowning because of their sin. Everyone must accept the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you're not a believer, I encourage you to come to Christ. And you have to decide when you're swimming and you're drowning in your sin. You have to decide when to call on the lifeguard. I can't make you do it. I can yell at you and say, you need the lifeguard. But you have to make that decision. But I especially want to talk to you who are Christians who have fallen prey to Satan and the false, fake gospel that tells you you must perform for God or you must be weighed down with guilt because you're really just a piece of dirt. You really can't ever be a good Christian because of what's happened in the past or even what happens today. Oh, you're such a hypocrite. You're so fake. Give it over to Jesus Christ. Give it over to him. That's the gospel. He'll take it away and renew your perspective. Will you still struggle with the fake gospel moving forward? Oh, yeah, you will. I'm a pastor. Just so you know, pastors don't have this all figured out either. For many years, I've believed the fake gospel. I'm very performance-oriented, and I'm very self-sufficient. But guess what? Spiritually, I can't do it. I need the Savior to work through me, to empower me. The performance-driven life will kill you. It will drive you crazy. If you feel like you have to keep performing to please God, it will kill you. You have to rest in Jesus' finished work. And when you finally give your will over and your arrogance over, you finally say, I'm going to finally trust Christ to work through me and to make me the man or woman of God he wants me to be, you're going to see some amazing things happen in your life. And it's not that you won't struggle in the future. But that's what the true gospel is about. And you will serve and you will love and you'll be committed to work for God, maybe even in much more powerful ways because you're motivated by love, God's love, not just pleasing him. As Ryan comes, I wanted to pray two verses from 1 Timothy chapter 1 as a prayer. And it's also the song that we're going to sing. That, that Ryan actually has written for us. And it's, we sang it earlier. And it's a powerful, powerful song from 1 Timothy, verse 17. But I want to also read verse 12. 
as a prayer for us. I thank you, God, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because you judge me faithful, appointing me to your service because of the true gospel of Christ. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Stand together. To the world to save. Despite our sin, you still forgave. Your saving mercy you have shown that your perfect patience might be known. honor and glory forever and ever we sing to the immortal invisible eternal king you alone are God of everything Pray for those along our path and intercede on their behalf. It's good and pleasing in your view for all to understand your truth. honor and glory forever and ever we sing to the immortal invisible eternal king you alone are God of everything eternal King you alone and you alone are God of everything so you alone and you alone are God of everything let's pray dear God I know there's probably somebody here that needs the gospel in their life. The lies of this world haven't provided the hope for their life. They've been disappointed and we have not arrived. We will only arrive when we come to the true gospel message, the Savior who came for sinners because you love sinners and you want to give them a new life. So I pray for anyone that doesn't know Christ, that if they need to come to the Savior and have more questions, I pray that they'll talk to either me or one of the other pastors before they leave. It's a matter of life and death. But I especially pray for us as Christians, we can fall kind of complacent in our mindset about the gospel message, even in our own lives. We just accept that, yes, we've trusted Christ and we have the gospel. 
but we allow Satan to influence our thinking that it's just about performance and pleasing you when in reality we need to rest in the Savior to work through us to change us from within we can't live the Christian life only you can through us so help us to evaluate our hearts today and for us who are prone to being self-sufficient help us to realize we're not and we need you we need to be humble we need the Savior bless our day in Christ's name we pray amen